Let us begin again. I just want to, so, to, say the, to end the last lecture with just a small comment. Some of you know the, the convolution already, and some of you came to me in the break and say, why did I calculate the, the convolution this quite complicated way? I mean, I think everybody agreed that until here it was a good idea, but then some people say it was too complicated what I did here. And I agree about that statement. I did it because some of you didn't see the convolution before, and I think this is, this is a way to explain how to calculate the convolution. But if some of you have seen the convolution before and you are able to just write down the values just by looking at this expression, of course you should just do that at the problem session today instead of going through the procedure ahead there. So if some of you who didn't see the, uh, the convolution before, they just want to know what do I mean with this statement and how can I do it in an easier way from here, then just ask me at the problem session. Then of course I'll come and explain that. Okay, so what we should do now is something else. We will start with the wavelets. So let's compare to what we did so far. We just had the Shannon. So we saw the Shannon sampling theorem, and we saw that this gives an, an orthonormal basis for the Paley-Wiener space. Our goal now is to construct an orthonormal basis for L2 of R. And this is actually a long-term goal, so this is not something I'll finish today. This is something we'll do next week, but we have to start. We take the, the beginning steps today. So the long-term goal <coughs> is we want to construct an orthonormal basis for L2 of R. And you saw I actually skipped the proof for the Shannon sampling theorem because I thought it was too long to give here. In the book, it takes something like two or three pages. So then you might ask, of course, how long will a proof be for this statement? And it turns out that almost everything in chapter 8 deals with these orthonormal bases. And then some of the proofs are actually not given in chapter 8. They are given in chapter 9. So if you look at chapter 9, this is something like 20 pages. And I'll say 15 of these pages are just devoted to put in the technical details in order to to construct this orthonormal basis. So what we'll do in this course is just that I will show you some of the steps in the construction of an orthonormal basis, and then at some point I just say, here is a big theorem, this tells you what you have to do, and if you want to prove that statement, you'd have to look at chapter 15, which is these 15 pages. But we'll take some steps that at least tells you what is going on in the construction of these orthonormal bases. So the starting point is to look at some of the operators that we had already in this course. So let's look at the scaling operator. So sometimes you also call it the dilation operator. And maybe you remember from the day I defined the operator, I had all these T, a and E, B and D, C. So I had a certain index, index on this operator. Now we actually look at just an operator without any index. And what this means is that we have predefined the index to be 2, and then we simply just don't write this index. So D is defined to be the operator from L2 into L2, which acts on a function f by taking 2 to the power a half and multiply it with f of 2x. So this will be the basic for the wavelets. What happens if we compose this operator with itself? So to compose the operator with itself means that we are looking at the operator d to the power 2 f of x. So d to the power 2, this is just short notation for d composed with d and then acting on f and calculate at x. So if you do it this way, then you know exactly how to calculate the operator. So what we have here means that we have to take the operator d and apply it to what is inside, which is d of f. And we do that using these rules. So we just write down what we have here, but with the f replaced by df. 
So what comes out is 2 to the power a half df calculated in the point 2x. And now we can do it once more because now we, again we have a scaling operator. So again, when we write this, we get a factor of 2 to the power half, which we multiply with this. So this all together gives us a factor of 2. And then f of, and you see d of f, then we have to multiply what we have inside here with a factor of 2. So we get f of 4x. And you can generalize this. So actually, you can take any j, which is just an integer, and then you can look at d to the power j of x evaluated at the point x. And it turns out that every time you apply the operator d, you get an additional factor of square root of 2. So that means all together at the end, you get the factor 2 to the power j divided by 2. And then inside the f, every time you apply the operator d, you get an additional factor of 2. So when you apply j times, you get 2 to the power j of x. So actually, what I'm doing here is just to explain that this is correct when j is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. But it turns out that this formula actually also works for j equal to minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and so on. So I'll not do any calculations uh, related to the negative numbers, but this formula actually also holds for the negative values of j. So what we'll do now is to fix one function in L2 of R. And because this turns out to be a, a very special this plays, uh, turns out to, to play a very special role in the theory. So I don't call it f, I call it psi instead. And according to this fixed function, we will define a collection of functions that depend on the psi, but we do some operations, and in order to make these operations clear, we put a j and a k as index on the new function. So we define the function psi j, jk of x, and the way this is defined is by taking these operators d to the power j, and we let them act on the translation operator tk on the function psi, and then we evaluate all this in the x. So again, how do we compose these operators? What we have here means that we let d to the power j act on the function tk psi. So this is the input. We take tk psi, and we put it into the relationship we have here. So what comes out is 2 to the power j half, and then we take our function, which is tk psi, and we evaluate it in 2 to the j x. So what comes out here is 2 to the power j half, and then psi of tk means that we translate by k, so we get psi in 2 to the j x minus k. And we look at all these functions, psi, j, k, where j and k are just integers. So what does this mean? So here, I just show you a, a picture of a realistic function. So. Let me see where I have it, yeah. So the function here, this is the starting point. So this function should correspond to our function psi. So what are we doing to this function? We still have it here, but we are translating it. That means we are taking the function and moving it back and forth on the real axis. So you see, what we have here is the same function as we have here, but we have just shifted it to this way. So this operation of Translating with k means that we take this function and we shift it by 1 and 2 and 3 and so on, and we also shift it by minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and so on. Then there are some more operations, some more pictures here, and they correspond to the operation with the scaling. So what I show here is this is what happens if you take j equal to minus 2, then you get more or less the same curve shape as you have here, but you get it compressed. Or if you take it with another value of j, you get that it is getting spread out like this. So this, when you, um, when you do it for, 
When you do it for negative j's, you get something like this. You get something that is spread out. When you do it for positive j's, you get something that's more compressed, like the one we have here. So you see, what happened here is that we have two things. We have this operation of stretching or compressing, and at the same time, we have the translation. This actually gives us the definition of the wavelet. So a wavelet is a very special choice of the function psi, such that this collection of function will form an orthonorm basis for L2 of R. So the condition is that the collection of function psi j k, where j and k run through the integers. So let's also write it in operator notation. So this is the collection of functions d to the power j t k psi. All these functions have to form an orthonorm basis for L2 of R. So why are we so interested in getting this orthonorm basis? So if this is the case, so if psi is a wavelet, then we get that all elements, all functions in L2 of R can be represented as infinite linear combinations of the functions of this type. And how do we get that? We again just refer to our main statement for orthonorm basis. So if we have a wavelet, then this means that all the functions that are here, they form an orthonorm basis. And this means that we can go back to our statement here and say, if you have an orthonorm basis, then all elements in the space can be written like this. So let's just write that down. So if you have a wavelet, then all f in L2 can be written as a sum. You see here, as index set, we have j running from k, uh, we have k running from 1 to infinity. Now, it is a little bit more complicated because we have two indices, we have j and k. So what happens is that we get a sum over j in c, and we get a sum over k in c, and then we get inner product between f, psi, j, k, times psi j k. So this happened for all f in L2 of R. Or if you write it down in operator notation, first of all, sometimes instead of writing two sums after each other, we'll just write it as the sum over j comma k belonging to C. This is a little easier notation to write it like this. And then what we have inside here is the inner product between f and psi j k. This is d to the power j t k psi. And this coefficient has to be multiplied with d to the power j t k psi. So no matter which function you give me, we can just calculate these numbers, and then we can put it into this representation. Then we get our function back. So again, you see what is going on here is actually analog to digital conversion because we put in a signal f, this is just a function in L2 of R, and the way we represent this function is as this infinite series, and what we need for this infin infinite series is just the sequence of inner products, which will be a sequence of numbers, of complex numbers. So again, we have transferred the analog signal into this digital sequence just consisting of, of the numbers that are here. So you see, the idea is exactly the same as we saw in the Shannon sampling theorem. Now, of course, you might ask, wavelets, they give us something nice, because now we can represent all functions f this way. So is it easy to be a wavelet, or is it complicated? And I think you can already, by sitting here and look at it, you can see that this is extremely complicated, in the sense that if any of you give me one function, 
I am completely sure that none of you will hit a wavelet. Because you need to pick this function extremely carefully. So to be a wavelet, this is a very exclusive property. Only very, very special functions are wavelets. So the observation is that this is a very special property. So this means only few functions can be wavelets. On the other hand, we can actually write down the first wave already now before we start to work. This does not mean that I will prove for you that this actually satisfies the condition, but I can write down the very first example of a wavelet. I'll do that now. And then what you will do at the exercise session today is that you prove some of the ingredients that you need to show in order to show that it's a wavelet. Some of them would be proved next week in another exercise. So the way I put it here is just to, to show you how a wavelet could look like. So maybe we keep this. And the interesting thing is that this is actually a very old function that I'll show you now. So this is the so-called Haar wavelet. which goes back to 1910. So Ha, he was not at all interested in wavelets. He just wanted to construct an orthonormal basis for L2 of R. And it turns out that the way he did it was then the very first construction of a wavelet. So in 1910, there was nothing like wavelet theory yet. So it was just an example of an orthonormal basis. So the function he defined was very close to what we have already seen. This is a function that either takes the value one or minus one, or zero. And it takes the one you value one if x belongs to the interval from zero to a half. It takes the value minus one if x belongs to the interval a half to one. And then it is zero if x does not belong to these intervals. So this is if x does not belong to the interval from zero to one. So it is easy to make a picture of that function. It just means that it is equal to 1 on the first interval, and then it is equal to minus 1, and then it is equal to 0 on the rest of the intervals. So we can actually write this function down in terms of the characteristic functions. So what we have here, you can see the function is simply equal to 1 on the first interval. So we have a characteristic function for the interval 0, a half. And then on the next interval from a half to one, it is minus one, but this just means that we make a subtraction of the characteristic function for the interval a half to one. So this is the way to, to write down the function. So as I said, Haar was not at all interested in wavelets. There were nothing like wavelet theory at this time. So when did the wavelet start to be interesting? So what we could call modern wavelet theory this is something that almost took place in your lifetime not completely but almost so this is something that started in 1987 <laughs> and then it is still ongoing so you know, mathematical theories are not something that just start and then they are completed the same day. So there was a breakthrough in this theory. But this came very soon after the introduction of wavelets. It came already in 1989. And this was via some constructions by a woman, Ingrid Dobuchy. And already with the background you have now, you can actually understand what she did. So what she did was to make a construction of wavelets. But 
you understand I need to say more than just construction of wavelet because the first wavelet was already appearing 80 years earlier so she did something else so the new thing she did was to make construction of wavelet with compact support And again, you might say, there's nothing new here, because you look at this function, this is also compactly supported. But the difference is that they have extremely good approximation theoretic properties. So let me just write good, but actually I mean extremely good. So actually what she did, was to construct a class of wavelets where there's a certain index n, and then when you take n to be larger and larger, you get better and better approximation theoretic properties. And if you look at that construction and you put in n equal to 1, you end up with exactly the first example, namely the hard wavelet. So whenever you go up with the n, you just get something that is stepwise better and better. So just to, to show you why they are good, we are, we are coming back to this in more details next week. But I think I already showed you the fingerprints. And they are actually compressed using her wavelets. So the first of these wavelets takes 30 megabytes. And then throwing in the Dovici compression methods, you get more or less exactly the same fingerprint. But this is stored on just one megabyte instead. So see, this is really a good compression rate. So we are coming back to this next week. So for now, we agree that it is complicated to construct the wavelets. We have the first example here, but how can we make a theory for how to construct wavelets? This is what we will attack now. So what I'll do is to go back to 87, and I will formulate the method for construction of, of uh, wavelet orthonormal bases that was founded at this, this time. So I need to, to warn you, what I'll do now is to fill one or two uh, blackboards just with a definition. And from the beginning, it will not be clear at all that you get anything interesting out of these definitions. Even when we end today, it will not be clear to you why exactly these properties are interesting. But hopefully next week you will understand that, that, they, that it, this is a good definition. So what we have to define is the so-called multi-resolution analysis. So a multi-resolution analysis So this is not something you want to write many times so this has the short name MRA. So this consists of two ingredients. First of all, we need a collection of closed subspaces of L2 of R. So it consists <coughs> of a sequence of closed subspaces of L2. And actually, this is an infinite sequence, so this is something that we denote with v, with index j, where j runs through all the integers. So this is a sequence of closed subspaces of L2 of R. So this is the first ingredient in the multi-resolution analysis. And then the second ingredient is just one special function and of course you would think that the function that comes here should be the wavelet but it turns out it is not the wavelet so what I write now is not the psi it is a phi instead such that and now you will get all these five properties that need to be satisfied. So we need to state what properties will phi have to satisfy, what properties will the VK have to satisfy.
The first property is something that we have not seen before, and this only relates to the spaces Bj. So what the property says is that whenever you increase the j, you get larger and larger spaces. So what this means is if you look at the space V0, then this is contained. This is the subspace of V1, which is the subspace of V2, and then it continues like this. But remember that the subspaces are indexed by the integers, so we also have negative j's. So V0 contains the space V minus 1, which contains the space V minus 2, and so on. So this is the first property. So the question is, the spaces are getting larger and larger when J increases. So how big are the spaces getting at the end? This is what the second condition says. It says that if you take the union of all these spaces, you almost get the full space L2 of R. So in the sense that if you take the closure of this space, then you get L2 of R. So actually what this says is that the spaces here, they are increasing with increasing value of J, and at the end, they fill out the entire space L2 of R. Some people in engineering literature will write that in a little bit more sloppy way. They will write the spaces like this, and then they will say, okay, these spaces increase, up to L2 of R. But this is not a very exact way of, of formulating. So the exact way of saying that these spaces end up feeling L2 of R is that we take the union of the space Vj and we take the closure, then we get L2 of R. On the other hand, what happens when we let J tend to minus infinity? Then what we see here is the spaces are getting smaller and smaller, but how small are they getting? And it turns out we have to require that at the end, the only vector that is in all of the spaces is the zero vector. And the way to formulate that is that if you take the intersection of all the spaces VJ, that means now we ask which element will be in all of the spaces, then what comes out is only the vector zero. So the interesting thing about these conditions I'm writing down here is that the first four of them have nothing to do with the function phi. They only relate to the spaces Vj. So the third condition gives us a relationship between the spaces Vj. And what it says is, if you're looking at any space Vj plus 1, then this is related to the space Vj in the sense that if you take the space Vj and we act on it with our scaling operator, then we get the space Vj plus 1. So you need to be careful about the meaning of this. Here, Vj plus 1, this is, the ve <coughs> this is a vector space. Again, Vj is a vector space, but D is an operator. So what this statement says is that the vector space Vj plus 1 is equal to the image of the space Vj under this operator D. So what this statement says, I mean to write down what this means, this is the set of all functions Df for which f is a function in Vj. So you see from the first condition that the spaces are forced to be larger and larger when J increases. There's no condition on how the spaces look like in the first condition. But here we see that there is a very clear relationship between the spaces in this region. The fourth condition only relates to the space V0. And it says that if a function f belongs to V0, then it follows that all integer translates of that function will also belong to V0. So what it says is, if you take a function that sits in the space V0 and we shift it by 1, shift it by 2, 3, and so on, and also by the negative numbers, then we get a new function that belongs to the same space. So all these conditions, they only relate to the spaces Vj. Now we get the fifth 
the last condition. That's the only one where the function phi comes in. So you see, a multi-resolution analysis consists of this sequence of spaces VJ and a function phi. So we also have to put in some conditions on the phi. And the condition about the function phi is that if you look at the function phi, and we look at all translates of the function, where k is just an integer, then this collection of functions will form an orthonormal basis for the space V0. So this is the structure we will have to work with next week. But I think already when you look at this, you can see that there are some, some problems here. So there are some issues that are not clear yet. First of all, it is by no means clear how to get these, con these properties satisfied. So it is not clear how to construct such a multi-resolution analysis. Here it just says a multi-resolution analysis has to satisfy these conditions, but we have no ideas how to do that in practice. The next thing is even worse, because if you have worked hard and you find out how to construct a multi-resolution analysis, there's nothing here that tells you how to get the orthonorm basis. Because if you have a multi-resolution analysis, this means that all these conditions are satisfied. This means that you have an orthonormal basis for the space V0. But our goal, and I think I have erased it already, our goal is to construct an orthonormal basis for L2 of R. And there's nothing here that makes it clear to you how to come from these con conditions and then to construction of an orthonormal basis of L2 of R. So this is a, a big problem at the moment. So it is not clear how to construct an orthonormal basis for L2 of R just based on an MRA. So this is what we'll see next week, that based on these assumptions, we can construct a certain function that after some manipulations will give us the wavelet. So this is next week that we do this. The only thing we'll do today is to take a very first step. And the first step is actually about looking a little bit closer at the conditions we have stated here. Because if you look at the way I have formulated it, you see, there's a condition number one, number two, number three, and number four. They only have to do with the spaces VJ. They somehow give us the impression that you can just choose these spaces such that these conditions are satisfied. And after doing that, then you choose a certain function phi such that you get an orthonormal basis for V0. So somehow it looked like the phi and the spaces VJ, maybe they're not completely unrelated, but at least you have a freedom of choosing a phi, and you also have a, choose, a choice of taking some spaces VJ. But this turns out to be wrong. So it turns out that if I come and I tell you which function phi I want to look at, then the conditions that are stated here, they don't give you any freedom with the choice of the spaces VJ. So in other words, if I tell you which function phi I want to work with, there's no freedom with the choices VJ. We are forced to take a certain choices of VJ. And this is what I would like to show you already now. So it looks like we have freedom in the choice of VJ, but this actually turns out to be wrong. And this is what you'll see very clearly from the statement. 
I put for you now. So this is actually the first result in the book. So there are two parts in the lemma, and the first one relates the spaces Vj to the space V0, and it says that the space Vj is actually the same as just the scaling operator to the power J acting on the space V0. But the one I actually am going for at the moment is the next one, which says that Vj is actually forced to be equal to the closed linear span of the vectors, and now you get the wavelet functions again. This is d to the power j t k acting on the function phi, where k runs through all the integers. So what this says, you can actually just look at this second statement, and then you can see whenever somebody tells you which function phi he wants to use, then this tells you how the spaces Vj have to be taken. So there is no choice of the spaces Vj when we have fixed the function phi. So the conclusion here is that phi actually determines the spaces Vj. So I want you to see the, the argument for that, and then we return to these issues next time. So actually, as we have already seen before, sometimes we have to split into j that are positive and j's that are negative. So I just give the argument for j positive. So let's look at the space vj, and we want to show that vj is the same as d to the power j v0. And I think the natural candidate between all the assumptions we have here would be to use the, the condition we have in free because this says that the space Vj plus 1 is equal to D applied to Vj. So if we use this, then we see that Vj is the same as the operator D acting on the space just before, namely Vj minus 1. But this is the same as D to the power 2 acting on the space Vj minus 2. So that means if you start with the space V5, for example, you'd say that this is the same as D applied to V4, which is the same as d to the power 2 applied to v3, and so on. And we simply do this a couple of times, and then at the end, this index has stepped down to 0. And then what we get on the top will be this. So this proves the first part of this statement. Now, to continue, we need to say something about the space v0. And I'd like to ask you, can any of you Tell me something about the space V0. How can we write down the space V0? So now we finished the proof of the first statement, and we are just on the way to prove the second part. So what I ask you is, can any of you say anything about the space V0? Linard? Yeah, because the V0 is just a span of all the delayed functions of P, but not uh, just uh, all the translated uh, functions of P. So you say, you, you mean translated? Translated. Yes. So you say V0 is the span of all translated versions of the function phi. 
This is almost correct. Almost. And and less. We need the closure. We need the closure. Yes. And why do we know that? That's because TK phi is an orthonorm basis for V0. And if you look at our characterization of orthonorm basis, you see one of them is here. Now the, the space we are looking at is V0. And one of the characterization of orthonorm basis is that an orthonorm system is a basis if and only if the closed span of the vectors is equal to our Hilbert space. And now the vector space, the Hilbert space, is V0. So this means, again, using this important theorem, theorem 4, 7, 2, then we actually know that V0 is TK phi. So what about the second part? We want to, to look at V, J. So according to what we just proved, we have already proved the first part. So we, we know that V, J is the same as D to the power J, V0. So this means this is the same as D to the power J. And then we put in what we know about V0. V0 is equal to this space. So this is V0 applied to the closed linear span of T, K, phi. So now the question is, how can we move on from here? And is it clear that we are allowed to move on, or what do you suggest? Casper? Uh, this EK operates as a linear product. So we have proved that exercise that we can take it inside an infinite sum. So you claim we have an exercise that allows you to take it in here. So let's just write down what happens if you do it. So if you do it, then we get the closed linear span of d to the power j t k phi, and again, we get it with the same index set, k in c. So if you do what you say, then we end up with exactly the result we want to prove. So the question is, you, you say something about an exercise, and this is completely correct, but um, I want to take it in, in some more steps. I want that we are very careful at this point. So. The point where we need to be careful, this is because the set we have looked at here is not just the span, it is the closure of the span. So what happened if we did not have the closure? If we just had an operator d, j acting on the span of some element t, k, phi. So let's do exactly the same as you suggested. So you say DJ can just go inside. So this is the same as the span of DJ TK phi, where K runs in C. And what you say is, this is allowed to do this because the operator is linear. Is this clear that we are allowed to do that? I think this is perfect because what is the span of a collection of vectors? This means that here we are looking at vectors that are just finite linear combinations of vectors tk phi. So this is just a finite linear combination of terms of this type. And since the dj is linear, then we can just let the dj act on each of the elements. And then what comes out is exactly the same linear combination of these functions. So that means if you don't have the span, if you don't have the closure on the span, then this is simply the linearity of the operator that allows us to do this. And then Casper said something about, about an exercise. So can you explain what, what allows you to do it when you have the closure here? Or can you just refer to the exercise? Or? So you say, 
the exercise tells you that if you have, maybe you should write it. You can write it here. So you say, we have an exercise saying that if you take dj and you apply it on an infinite sum, so let's just say ck, ek, then this is the same as the sum ck, d, j, e, k. That's correct. We had an exercise of this type that says that if a series of this type is convergent, we can take an operator and we can put it inside, so we get this. But is this exactly what we need now? Is this enough? And why is this not enough? <laughs> Christian? I suppose we need to do it to the finite sum. At least, at least um, our, our set is finite. If we have to for this one. No, this is actually not the point where the problem is. We have to do it with some infinite sets. But the problem is that sets in the closure of a span of something it might not be something that can actually be written on this form. So there are some very special cases, and you, you will see it in one of the exercises at the end of the course, that there are some very special cases where elements in the closure of the span, they cannot be written like this. Actually, I say you will see it at the end of the course, but actually we already had one exercise that showed exactly that. So um, we had these exercise 2, 7, or uh, 2, 8, if you look at the exercise 2, 7, then this gives an example where this space, the closed linear space of, of some elements, that this is equal to the entire space we are looking at, but there are some elements that cannot be written on this form. So actually, exercise 2, 7 tells us that it is not enough to look at this exercise. So, actually, there's another exercise that tells us that the step from here and then to here, that this is correct. But which exercise? Can you see? We had something 213. And what it says is, under more assumptions than just that the operator t is bounded, it has to be invertible, and the inverse has to be bounded, then t applied to the closure of a set is the same as the closure of t applied to the set. So actually, if we apply this result, then we can put in uh, an inter intermediate step saying that what we have here Maybe, I hope you can see it if I write it here. So the step will be to go from this set and then to say, instead of taking dj to the closure of a set, then this is the same as d to the power j, and then just apply it to the span itself. And then take the closure of this set. So this is exercise. I hope you can read it, exercise 213, that allows us to do this. And now, what we have here is just dj applied to the span of some vectors. And then the argument we gave over there says that here dj can be put inside. So then we get the span of d to the power j t k phi k in c. And then we have the big closure on this set, so this comes here. And this proves exactly what we want here. So with this addition, then we actually finished. So we don't go straight from here and then to here. We put this just in a bracket. So we say, we have this, and then by the exercise, this is equal to what we have here. And then we use this argument for, for finite combination that we have over there to get to the conclusion here. So this means, at the end, we arrive at exactly this statement. So there are a lot of technical details in this. And what you'll see when we get through with wavelets is that even though this is more or less an engineering subject today, then in order to do it in a correct way, you actually need almost all the mathematics that we learned in mathematics for so far. So mathematically, it's a very complicated subject. 
So what you'll do today at the exercises, there are not very many exercises today, and that's because one of them is exercise 8.2, and what you'll do is actually to look at, at a function phi, which is just equal to the characteristic function for the interval 0, 1, and then for this function, you will go through all these points in the definition, and then you will show at the end that this function actually generates a multi-resolution analysis. And you can already see all these conditions that there's a lot of work in that exercise. So don't get stressed if you are more or less stuck with this exercise for, <laughs> for about one and a half hour. So this is the program for today. So see you at the problem session.